so I walked out the door, set out on the path unwinding, aiming for the stars, but I wound up in the dark, didn't know this road would be so lonely. Take me just as I am. 
nation Rise and defeat, that's the operation God gave us grace, that's a celebration Why you're hearing this song across the station Wanna move forward, not stagnant, plan them So we stay steady, not random Painting a picture, candid, look so good You could call it handsome, handsome Gave us the power, not standard, plugged in, phantom Opera, anthem, anthem When they ask what jewels I require I say, God, could he's taking me higher Higher, 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 higher
deeper still as you call me, deeper still into your love, 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 you're a good, good bond, it's who you are, oh, it's who you are, You're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. And I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's you are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect. Good morning, everybody. My name is Josh, and we welcome you. You know, I I know that song's kind of been mean to because it's like you know it's like everywhere for a long time. But every time I play it, it's like wow, the lyrics are actually like really good, right? Um, but that's just a great reminder for our goddess. And as we you know, we have a guest speaker today, and really excited to hear you know what he's going to preach about. But as we kind of get into that mode of worship. wanted to share with you guys this is very actually a very short verse it's just hebrews 2:1, and it's a warning against neglecting salvation and says therefore we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard lest we drift away from it so this is actually talking about apostatizing um it's kind of the writer we don't know exactly who the writer of hebrew is but they're he's challenging the reader that We need to diligently remain the truth, right? Lest we drift away from it. And I was actually thinking about this kind of. I was thinking about what what comes to my mind when I was thinking about drifting. And I remember, um, I forgot where I was. Either in Florida or Hawaii, but it was in a beach, and we we're just kind of swimming around, just kind of you know, <clears throat> chilling in the beach. And then, like after a few, like a while, I was just like. I realized I drifted away from the shore, like, and I was like, "Whoa!" I'm like a lot farther than I thought it would be, so I need to go back. And I was like, "Oh, that's exactly what happens when we spiritually drift away." Because I don't know about you, in my life, there be times when I'm really dry, and it's like months pass by, and I'm like, "Oh shoot!" Like I've been so far away from God, I didn't even know it, right? And that's how we easily drift away. It's not like a one moment, quick moment. It's like I'm here. And then all of a sudden, I'm far away from God. It's like a slow drift away. And John Piper says that our life is not like a lake. This world isn't a lake. It's actually a river, because the river is continually flowing down, right? And if you think about it, the church and Christianity will always be countercultural. And it's very easy for us to kind of drift away and drift with the flowing of the river towards, you know, the secular world, right? Which leads to destruction. We gotta be like continue kind of swimming up against the current because if we don't do that, we're just gonna slowly drift away into destruction. And I was just kind of challenging as a church, right? Are we just kind of drifting, just kind of going through life, kind of on a lazy river, just kind of going down the stream, <laughs> or are we actually diligently remaining in the truth by swimming up against the current, right? The church, I think it's 
good to remind ourselves that Christianity is countercultural. It's not going to be the most po- popular thing in the world. It will always be countercultural. And I pray that our church, we remain diligently strong in the truth. We won't so easily be swayed and drifting into the things of this world that right, continually try to, hey, come over here, do this or do that, try this or that. So let's pray together, church. Uh, I pray that our church region, Lord, will be a church that's countercultural. That's not the most popular thing that this world, the secular world, wants us to be, Lord. Just kind of saddening for me as I see a lot of churches starting to compromise the biblical truth for what is considered popular in modern culture, Lord. That our church will be firmly rooted in the truth so that we're not swayed by the things of this world that tries to slowly drift us away from who you are, Lord. Help us to remain diligent in the truth, Lord. Help us to know the Bible, Lord, so that we are able to discern for ourselves that we're not constantly just being spoon-fed by somebody else. But Lord, help us to really dive into the revealed revelation of the word, which is the revealed truth, God, in our lives, that you are the truth and the way and the life. So help us to really worship you this morning. Help us to have an encounter with you, Lord, so we can be rejuvenated in the spirit, but not just here, Lord, every day in our life. Help us to be really deeping dive into the word, deeping dive into relationships and edifying one another, Lord so that we'd be a church that continues to grow, not just physically, but actually spiritually, Lord. Jesus, I pray, amen. The moon and stars, they wet. The morning sun was then The Savior of the world was fallen His body on the cross His blood poured out for us The weight of every curse upon Him No breath he gave as heaven looked away. The Son of God was laid in darkness. A battle in the grave, the war on death was waged. The power of hell forever broken. The ground began to shake. The stone was rolled away, his perfect love could not be overcome. Now death, where is your sting? Our resurrected King has rendered you
So we'll sing, we sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. We sing
every breath I long to follow Jesus For he has said that he will lead me home And day by day I know he will renew Until I stand with joy before the throne To this I own My hope is only Jesus All the glory evermore to Him When the race is complete Still my lips shall remain Yet not I but through Christ in me To this I all My hope is only Jesus All the glory evermore to Him When the race is complete Still my lips shall repeat Yet not I but through Christ in me When the race is complete When the race is complete Still my lips shall repeat Yet not I but through Christ in me Yet not I but through Christ in me Christ in me. All right. Good morning, Regen. Good morning. Uh, we're going to transition now into a time of prayer. And um, yeah, as I was thinking about this morning and just the passage we're going to be going over. You know, I think of uh, the many times that Jesus has healed people in his ministry and how like all these people that were either like sick or they had some sort of problem physically they were in that place for a very very long time i mean some even died and jesus came to meet them and as i, as I think about it you know you think about the timing of all of what jesus did and we always say in the church we always say god's timing is always perfect but there is a moment that we as individuals have to make a decision to actually meet Jesus. To actually come and be in his presence for the very first time. And then when we come, the question I ask is, how do we approach our God? Do we approach him with a heart of like doubt and saying, well, we'll see what you can do, Jesus. Or do we approach Jesus with a heart of anticipation? Do we approach Jesus with a little bit of cynicism? Like, you know, you've, you've tried before, God, but you've never been able to really heal me. Or do we come to Jesus with a heart of faith? And so this morning, we're about to, we're about to pray, and specifically, we're praying about healing. And we're asking that God is a God that still heals today. And if we do believe that he will heal us, the question this morning is, what do we need healing from and sometimes we always think it's a physical thing but I want to really go deeper than the physical and then ask maybe there's something emotionally painful for you maybe there's a trauma that you've experienced in your life that you're still holding on to whatever you need healing from our God it may be healing of our relationships it may be healing from the time that you were so betrayed and you're so hurt that you're still angry about or angry towards that person. This morning, I believe our God, our God, Jesus, is the God that can heal. And it says in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 10, And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to, his, to this eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore confirm strengthen and establish you church i believe that with all my heart that our god can heal 
And this morning, can we pray? To the God of heaven, that he would heal you, heal us, so that we can live a life where we can actually be a testimony to the people that need to hear the love of our God. So shall we pray, church, right now? Let's pray. God, we thank you that you are a God that does love us enough that you care for everything that we go through in life. And that, God, that you do care enough for all of our pain and suffering that we go through. God, this morning, God, would you restore us? God, would you restore? God, would you bring about a transformation? God, would you bring about a regeneration in our lives? Regenerate the relationships that we have. God, regenerate, God, the pain and the sorrow and the trauma, God, that we may have experienced. Knowing, God, that you can do all things because we believe, God, you are the God that can do all things. We believe, God, you are the God that can redeem everything. Regardless of, God, what we have gone through in our lives, God, that that could be a testimony, God, to you and to the future, God, of what you are calling us, God, in our lives, God. May we not just receive, God, these blessings and not do anything about them, God. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much, God, this morning. That, God, we come before you realizing, God, that we need you more and more every day. And God, forgive us, God, for at times living a life that is so separate that we sometimes push you away and we put you on a Sunday morning corner. And God, the rest of the weeks, uh, we do what we want to do. But God, this morning I pray that we would lean a little bit deeper into you, God, and realize, God, we can't do our lives, God, without you. God, in our brokenness, God, we need you more and more. And God, we need you to heal, God, our hearts so that, God, in turn, we can actually live a life, God, for you. And so, God, help us this morning. Because we do believe, God, by faith that we can approach you, God, with confidence, knowing, God, that you are the God that has gone through everything in this world. And still we can come to you for all of our prayers. And so, God, we thank you so much, God, this morning. God, we love you. It's in Jesus Christ's name we pray. And all of God's people said... Amen, amen, and amen. All right, good morning, everyone. If you want to grab a seat, um, we're going to welcome everyone to Welcome Regeneration Community Church. It's good morning. It is a good morning. Uh, there's some weird guy this morning was praying while he was cr uh, leading prayer time. I don't know what's going on. Anyways, we want to welcome you. Uh, we want to welcome you to Regen. Uh, we call ourselves Regen for short. Uh, we'll just go through some quick announcements. Uh, this is the way we give. Uh, we are a church plant. If you don't know, uh, we survive by God's grace, obviously. And then we also survive uh, financially Do, through these ways. As you can tell, this is the way we give. Um, it's pretty standard, right? All right, cool, cool, cool. All right. Uh, we want to welcome our newest of members to our church who took membership class. I know those pictures look, uh, look amazing, right? Yes, there's that. There's a, like a. These are like all model photos here, <laughs> except Jethro looks a little cold in that picture. That was a prophecy right there. That was taken in the summer. But then this is this is how it feels today. This morning it feels really cold. <laughs> all right, so welcome them. If you guys don't see them, or if you see them, I mean around, just like say hi and say welcome. All right, so Yam and Fam Olympics, guys. If you don't know, we've been announcing this for a few weeks, right? So uh, we're going to combine the two groups of our young adult ministry as well as our family ministries. And because people always, at least the young adults sometimes say, like, we don't know what's going on with the families. And the families sometimes, no, they never say, they, are, well, they never ask. They never ask about the young adults. I'm kidding. They do ask. They're like, hey, how's the other group of, how's the other side of the church doing? And so we're going to actually get together. We're going to eat, I'm sure, a lot of good food. And then we're going to play some Olympics. It's going to be very competitive. I think I think some of the people that are really competitive, you got to watch out for. My wife. Uh, everyone else should be okay. They're not too competitive. They don't, like, curse or they don't, like, bite, right? What? You don't curse? Okay. Uh, but it should be it should be fun. It's coming up this Saturday. So if you haven't signed up, please do. And, oh, and then next Sunday, um, if you are part of our church, we actually do Regen Reboot. You might be wondering, what's a reboot? Do you get a new boot for your shoes no uh we reboot ourselves 
uh, in the sense that we ask all the people that are part of our church, uh, or if you're not even a part of our church, we welcome you to come after service. Uh, we provide food to like really appreciate those of you that are serving within our church. And then we uh, recast the vision of our church, like help you guys understand where we are right now, where we want to be. Uh, we go through like sometimes discussion of our finances. We go discussions about different ministries that we're going to be doing and, and just sort of to help you understand like, hey, we're still moving forward, right, as a church. And so you can come along and just kind of hear the vision of the church. Uh, and that's going to happen this coming Sunday. So bring your appetite and uh, yeah, just be a part of that. Cool. All right, uh, Thanksgiving Sunday potluck lunch is coming up. So there is going to be a sign-up sheet uh, that there's a beautiful lady in the front that's holding. Uh, Vanna White is in the front. Um, no? Okay. That's much, That's an old joke. Like only like ni- people that are in like, you know, the 1970s were born in that understand that joke. Anyways, um, but there is a sign-up for potluck. It's going to be, happen- be happening on November 12th, as you can see. So please sign up, and we're going to, again, feast. I feel like church, that's all we do is eat. Like, I'm surprised that we're not all, like, obese and we're, like, laying over our, our chairs that we're sitting next to. But it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. Uh, Christmas wish sponsor. So this is actually, uh, I, I think, a Julianne thing. Right? Julianne thing? Okay. So Julianne works at a nonprofit, and there are children that she serves. Uh, there are obviously low-income children. And so if you want to uh, sign up and actually sponsor a child for this upcoming Christ- Christmas, uh, it's uh, any gift, right, we're talking about? Any gift? Okay. They want specific. These kids want specific things. They don't, they don't just want junk. They just want specific toys that are like high-quality toys. They so Julianne will have a list of what uh, these kids, these non-spoiled kids want. Uh, they really want these specific toys. I think I've actually heard like one of our people donated like or, or sponsored already 10 kids, which is, which is amazing. Like who would do that? Who would do that? Right? Who would do that? Who would do that? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I'm looking at the person right now, actually. I'm looking at the person. If you can see my eyes, my small eyes. Okay, here we go. Oh yeah, right before before I introduce uh, our guest speaker, I, I want you guys to understand Regen. I don't want us to think Regen is like like every Sunday you hear this like like this Asian guy come up here with a very heavy accent and say like hello everybody like that's not church, right? I hope that's not church. Hopefully you don't go to a church like that. Maybe you do. <laughs> Maybe that is Regen. Like you, everyone talk like this, like you know, and it's time to worship God, all right? <laughs> And if that's the church you're coming to, man, God bless you. God bless you. But I would like our church uh, not to listen to some Asian guy that constantly has like bad jokes or talk like very heavy accent. But I would like diversity, right? I like just even if you look around this room, hopefully you'll see diversity, right? And so, and I think that's what they, the way heaven's going to be as well, you know. Maybe you might hate heaven that way. <laughs> like, uh, you're going to be in your own little corner of the world and be like, this is my heaven. Um but God made all of us in his image. And what I love about uh, preaching is that I actually love not to preach and have someone else's voice come up and you can hear their voice and you can like see their style. And, and that's the way church should be. And, and that's at least my vision for the, the pulpit is that um, it shouldn't always be the same voice, if that makes sense. So like, you know, if one day Uche wanted to come up here and like grab a donut and start preaching, I'll be like, You'll bring up your sweatpants and just preach, brother, you know, even though he just left the room. But it's okay, you know, it's okay. He's like, he doesn't even listen to me. <laughs> it's like a Sunday. He doesn't listen to me anyway. So anyways, so with that being said, was that too much? Was that too much? Okay. Anyways, so with that being said, uh, I want to introduce our guest speaker. He brought his beautiful family with, with him. Um, he has amazing hair like Jesus, uh, if you look at him. Maybe him and his wife, they probably like compete every morning and figuring out who has the best hair day. Uh, he, he does a lot of, he's done actually church plants, helped out churches, start up, sort of like ours. Uh, he's, he actually has a nonprofit. He does coaching. Um, what do you not do actually? So, uh, but he, I just, he told me just to introduce him as a man who loves God. Uh, and he's going to do that. Uh, he's going to share his heart this morning. So if you can welcome Trog, I know that sounds like a name that you don't familiar. Trog. And he's going to share the word.
It might, it's my mic. There's the mics on. How are we doing? It's great to be there. You go. One person says I'm good. Uh, my joke is I used to look like Jesus, but now I look like Moses because I'm getting so old. Uh, but that's the way it works. Uh, will you pray with me? Lord, open our eyes that we can see the wonderful things in your law. Give us understanding according to your word. Holy Spirit, fill this room with your tangible presence that we may be forever changed. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart always be pleasing in your sight. And Lord, will you give these people the best of me for your glory. Come in power, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So I am very glad to be here today. Um, last year I helped coach uh, Che's son and my son, Rocky's back in the, the corner over there, uh, in basketball. And Josiah wore a t-shirt that said, I think this is right, be a disciple, make a disciple. Or be disciples, make disciples. And I was like, that's my church. I love that church. And this was before I met Che. And so I was like, man, whoever's wearing that, Josiah, where'd you get that shirt? And I think I had a small conversation. And of course, Che and I met then, I think, at the, really we got to talk at the airport uh, when we dropped our kids off uh, on a mission trip. And so... Uh, listen, my name is Trog Trogden. I'm the founder of Kingdom Focus Coaching, which is a uh, discipleship ministry. I'm also the author of a book called A Walk to Wisdom. Blah, blah. My publisher tells me to tell you that. I don't really care. Um, but I'm supposed to say that. Um, my life's work is to equip disciples to make disciples. Francis Chan once said, if you really want to experience God, go and make disciples. And I couldn't agree more. If you really want to experience God, go and make disciples. So in my ministry, I get to teach people every day how to really experience God by first being a disciple and walking with Jesus and then give them the tools, the training, and the confidence they need to go and make disciples. Am I hitting? Is that, is that, do you hear something? Raise it. Is that, is that better? Is that better? Okay, sorry, if that happens again, let me, I can talk loud enough that I really don't even need a mic, so uh, if I get too excited, you're going to have to raise the volume up and down. So uh, in my ministry, I get to teach people every day how to really experience God. Uh, I give them the tools, the training, and the confidence they need to make disciples, and that's my goal this morning for each of you, is I want to encourage you to be even better disciple makers, because I know you're already doing it. So with Kingdom Focus Coaching, I walk people through a three-step process, and it starts with this, know, and then grow, and go. Very simple, discipleship. Know where you're at in your walk with Christ, grow in him, and go and make disciples. So Paul says, before you take communion, to examine yourselves, to know if, in fact, you are in the faith. This is 2 Corinthians 13.5. The whole book of 1 John was written to solidify in your hearts that you, in fact, are a child of God if you have repented of your sins and put your faith and belief in Jesus Christ. I use a spiritual survey to begin the discipleship process. And this is where um, I can share it with Che later. We can use all sorts of stuff that would help you guys. But it walks through one's confidence in their ability to practice a spiritual discipline. And then it walks them through... Um, their consistency of practicing it. So one is head knowledge and the other one is heart knowledge. Head knowledge is that you have the ability to pray, you have the ability to read the scriptures, you have the ability to journal, but also the consistency is really how much time you spend with Jesus. How much do you love spending time in the word? I won't let people give me a number 10 until they can teach it. So in the ability, I say, hey, I know when they're ready to go and make a disciple, when they can teach how to pray, how to read the scriptures, those kinds of things. And so I think it was Ian Bounds that said, you know how much you love something by the amount of time you spend with it, right? Or with them, maybe we should say. And so that is a little bit about uh, the no part. The grow is the five fundamentals of discipleship. These are, are very simple, but Jesus said, I'm, I am too loud. I, I can hear it popping. Is that all right? Um, Jesus said, love God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, and your strength, and love your neighbors yourself, right? You heard that one before? So the five spiritual disciplines that I teach are about the inward man loving Christ, and then the outward man, which is loving others, okay? And so we call one a quiet time. We call the other one community. So they are this, 
Bible study, specifically meditation on the word of God and application, right? If you don't apply it, if you don't obey it, then do you really believe it? Two is prayer. Prayer is talking to God, listening to God, and fellowship with God. So that's an important distinction there. If it's just talking to God, that's one thing, but it's listening to God. Do you know how to hear the voice of the Lord? And lastly, it's communing and fellowshipping with God. Journaling, last part of the um, internal man, the inward man, is journaling, reflecting on what Jesus is telling you. The Bible is one big journal from God, really. It's his voice to mankind. So that's the inward man. The second part is the outward man, serving others. Do we serve others in Jesus' name? My mentor said that serving others is the hinge on the door of salvation. Uh, You talked about giving the kids the Christmas stuff and helping them with food. That's the hinge on the door of salvation. They might say, why would somebody invest their time and money in me? And we get to say, because of Jesus. And then lastly is to share the gospel. I break it down into witnessing and evangelism. Witnessing is the nonverbal proclamation of the gospel. Witnessing would be wearing a cross or a t-shirt like Josiah did. Um, but evangelism is the verbal proclamation of the gospel. And so I break those down. And so that, those are the five fundamentals of discipleship. So we have know where you're at in your walk with Christ, grow, and then today we're going to talk about go. All right? So I'm going to give you a four-step process that can help you learn how to teach any principle, any doctrine in the scriptures. And hopefully when you walk out today, uh, you'll feel better about how to do that. Now, I am originally a hillbilly, okay? So that's why I have the beard and the long hair. Uh, I have not been on Duck Dynasty, although <laughs> I, I have met Phil Robertson, if that helps. Um, but I was in a, uh, grew up in a town of 7,000 people in the rural hill country of Missouri. I grew up on a dirt road where the dust actually settled. And so uh, and Texas is a little different. They're rednecks here, so I'm a hillbilly, so I'm like way down on the totem pole. Uh, <laughs> My dad taught us at a Baptist college. My grandfather was a pastor, and so I grew up in a Christian home. I remember giving my life to Christ at Southern Hills Baptist Church when I was five years old. I remember the communion plate being passed around, and I started crying because I didn't know why, actually. But my dad took me in the back prayer room. I don't remember the exact words, but I remember giving my life to Christ and my dad saying that the angels were rejoicing in heaven that day. And that was when I was five years old. But I do want to be honest with you. Sadly, though I grew up, I I grew up thinking three kind of, I wouldn't call them lies, but they were certainly uh, wrong perspectives of the scriptures. And I wonder if any of you guys have felt these too. When I was five years old and growing up, I thought, well, I know Jesus. I'm going to heaven. I have my ticket. And that's really it. That's where it stopped. I didn't understand Ephesians 2.10 that says God had prepared good works in advance for me to do, and he wanted me to walk in those ways. I didn't understand that there was a purpose for my life beyond just getting into heaven, which is awesome, by the way. That's not, I don't want to say just, but you know what I'm saying there. And so the eternal life is now, is what the scripture says. That we get to walk with Jesus. Our relationship is restored with God through Christ. Second, I believe the Bible was just a rule book telling me what I couldn't do. And as a kid, I felt it kind of ruined my fun. <laughs> Anybody ever felt like that way? At least when you're early on in your walk with Christ. It took me years to understand that obedience actually blesses us and that God wants to protect us and that his commands are not a burden but a blessing. So if you have that thought today, please think about that. It's in 1 John. And thirdly, I I believe that heaven was way better than hell and perfect. I knew that, but in my head it was perfectly boring right? Like, I couldn't really picture heaven. And later I began to understand how awesome and amazing heaven is going to be, and that any adventure I long for on earth will be 10 times better in heaven. I've been skydiving. I've done some fun stuff. That's going to be nothing compared to what heaven is going to be like, tenfold. You know, the Bible says we can't even think or imagine what heaven is going to be like. So, I graduated high school. I went to college in North Carolina, but I was still a baby believer, And I wasn't reading my Bible. I wasn't in Christian community like you guys are. I got my undergrad, my graduate degree at 23 years old from a place called Campbell University. And then I moved down to Dallas. And I, to be honest with you, wanted to make a lot of money. That's really all I wanted to do. In fact, I had it figured out, and I even told God, the more money I make, the more I can give you, Lord. Isn't that a good deal, right? And then I figured that the Lord had different plans. I would read the scriptures, and he would say, Labor not to be rich, cease from thine own wisdom. I would read the scriptures and I would go, wait a minute, he owns the world. (laughs) You know, 10% of my money is nothing to God. 
And so he began to work that out of me. But at 23, I fell in love with Jesus all over again. I plugged into a great church, Preston Wood. We call it Six Flags Over Jesus. It's kind of a joke. Uh, but I know some of you guys are a part of our community. So, uh, you know, but it's a great church. I got discipled and I began my 20 year journey of the discipleship ministry that I'm in now. I'm married to my beautiful wife over there, Mindy, 19 years. We just celebrated. She can raise her hand or embarrass her. Yeah. We have three kids. There's seven back there. I won't say their middle name. Oh, I'm going to. Seven Ezra. There's Rock Titus. Truth is addicts right there. They're 14, 12, and 10. Um, I got to baptize Rock and Truth. Uh, my best friend baptized seven. I'm so grateful the Lord has answered our prayers so uh, that they all love Jesus. Um, so after my reawakening, I would call it, I still didn't have a model for discipleship. It was like I had a passion to go and make disciples, but I didn't know how. It was like I wanted to go into battle, but I didn't have a gun, right? It was, it was that deal. And so later on, a friend showed me a process of discipleship, and that's the know, grow, and go. And we've been tweaking it and building onto it and adding it and, and trying to make it even more simple. Um, but the part that I wanted to share with you, as I mentioned, is go. Go and make disciples. This is in Matthew 28. I'll get to it in a second. But if you can answer, and if you journal uh, or take in notes, I would say this. Write these four questions down. And this can work with any biblical principle or any doctrine, anything you want to teach. We have Sunday school classes, whatever you do. Answer the questions, what is it? Why is it important? Why don't I do it? And then how do I do it? What is it? Why is it important? Why don't I do it? And how do I do it? So let's walk through that today, and we're going to use discipleship. So what is discipleship? Here's the summary. Discipleship is the process of helping another person become mature in Christ. It's that simple. Helping another person become mature in Christ. Now I'll give you a longer definition. Because I'm a little wordy. That's why I get to preach, right? Like I just keep talking. All right. Discipleship is the intentional and relational process of helping another person become mature in Christ. Through the knowledge of and obedience to the word of God. And lastly, I would add, and in the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay, so that's a long definition. I'll break down a few of them for you. Intentional. Jesus says, go. He says, go. He doesn't say stay. He says, go. We weren't saved to sit down. We were saved to be sent out. Amen? That just came out. That wasn't in my notes. But are you with me? All right? It's relational. In 1 Thessalonians, Paul says this, But we were gentle among you like a nursing mother taking care of her own children. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves, because you had become very dear to us. That's relational. For maturity, it says, Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. And then Paul says, For this I toil, struggling with all his energy that is powerfully at work within me. It's relational. It's for maturity. It's in the knowledge of God's word. We are transformed by the renewing of our, somebody say it, mind. By the renewing of our mind. Obedience, John 15, really quickly I'll say this. In John 15, he says, Remain in me and I in you and you'll bear much fruit. Anybody heard that one? And he says, Remain in me and I in you and my words in you. And then he says, Remain in me and my words in you and obey. We don't get to abide with Christ without obeying Christ. Are you with me? Those two go hand in hand. Abiding is not just sitting in your quiet time going kumbaya. That's awesome. You should do that more. But abiding is obeying. And lastly, in the power of the Holy Spirit, uh, Jesus told the disciples, he said, when he ascended into heaven, go and wait in Jerusalem for power on high. Right? So here's a quote for you. We are powerless until he empowers us. We are powerless until he empowers us. So that's what? That's what is discipleship. All right? So again, if you guys get to teach anything or do anything, just ask, what is it? Define it. Like prayer, what is prayer, right? It's talking to, listening to, and communing with God. All right, now step two, why is it important? You guys still with me? Why is it important? A few things, I wrote down four or five. The last thing someone says to their loved ones before they go to heaven is often the most important. Would you agree with that? 
The last thing someone says before they go to heaven is most important. The timing of Jesus' statement in Matthew 28 is incredibly significant. When he says, go into all the world and make disciples, it's the last words that Jesus spoke to his disciples on earth right before he ascended into heaven. Go, make disciples. As Christians, there's no greater goal we should strive to accomplish with our lives than Jesus' final command to make disciples, to baptize them, and to teach them to obey. Okay? So it's the last thing that Jesus said before uh, he went to heaven. Two, it's a command. The famous missionary Hudson Taylor once said, the Great Commission is not an option to be considered, it's a command to be obeyed. Think about that. Matthew 28, when he says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. You guys know this one. This is your church, right? This is your passion. This is your mission. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you to the end of the age. This is the Great Commission. That's not an option. We don't get to say, I love Jesus and let me stay in my holy huddle right here in my house and do nothing. That's not the way it works. Jesus commands us to go. How are people going to hear the good news if we don't go? That's the point. He doesn't say, by the way, wait for a calling or wait for a special extra revelation. He doesn't say this to a select few people or give this instructions only to Che and ministers and pastors at churches or those that wear collars. That's not what he said. And so I like to say it this way. Every member of the body of Christ is a minister. Right? Every member of the body of Christ is a minister. You are a minister. You represent Jesus to a lost world. You will be in contact with people that I will not be in contact with. So whether you're a dentist, a doctor, or a student, what are you waiting for? What are you waiting for? Jesus has said, go. And it's obeying him. And by the way, you get to experience him even more fully. Or, side note, if you had a Ferrari in your garage, would you be content reading the manual or would you want to drive at 120 miles an hour? Too many of us are content reading the manual. But he wants us to experience the 120 miles an hour with him in the great adventure called life, leading others to Christ. We are ambassadors for Christ and God is making his appeal through us. All right, how are we doing? Are we good? Three, humanity is hardwired with a desire for discipleship. Let me explain this. We're all being discipled and influenced by someone. The only question is by who? The only question is by who? Everyone has a role model growing up, a hero of sorts. Could be LeBron James or Tiger Woods or Taylor Swift, if you're a Swifty in here. (laughs) But you have a favorite uncle, a favorite cousin, something. Ideally, it's your own father that's your hero. But even with kids that are great dads, there are other champions in their lives that they look up to. The Rangers are playing the World Series, right? I'm sure that people are looking up to the Rangers. And by the way, somebody's looking up to you. That desire, I believe, to have a hero, to look up to somebody, is the innate desire to be discipled. God hardwired it into our DNA, our spiritual DNA, in my opinion. Furthermore, as we get older, as you can tell, I'm getting older. We want to leave a legacy. We want to be remembered and pass on valuable information to the next generation. And this too, I believe, is a God-given, hardwired aspiration in the hearts of man. And here's the cool part. By making disciples, we get to both. (laughs) By making disciples, we get both. We get to be um, encouraged and influenced by godly men and women, and we get to leave a legacy. When my, when my mentor died at his funeral, I was thinking of Hebrews when it said about Abel, even though he died by his faith, he still lived. And that's my question for you. By your faith, if you died today, will you still live in what you shared about the gospel and about Christ to other people? That's my challenge. Read Deuteronomy 6 tonight if you want to learn more about what God says and how to uh, pass on this to your kids. Uh, and who was the guy who had five kids? Does anybody beat that? Somebody had five kids in here. Does anybody have more? Okay. But Deuteronomy 6 is a great, right? He's, he, does he win? Deuteronomy 6 is the passage. All right, number four. Disciples, the disciples we make, and catch me on this, guys, the desires we make are our hope 
and joy and crown of boasting on judgment day. Okay, when we meet Jesus face to face, because we all will, whether you're a believer or a non-believer, you're going to meet Jesus face to face. Okay, and when you meet Jesus face to face, it's the people we have poured into and helped to grow in their walks with Christ that will be our pride and joy before the Lord on judgment day. And I'll prove that to you with two verses in Thessalonians and Philippians, which uh, who led us in prayer with Philippians today. To go one more chapter, Philippians 4. He says this, Therefore, my brothers, whom I love and I long for, my joy and crown stand firm thus in the Lord. In Thessalonians, he says it even more explicitly and more clear. He says this, For what is our hope and joy or crown of boasting before the Lord Jesus at his coming? Is it not you? For you are our glory and our joy. Think about that. The people you are pouring into are your crown and joy of boasting on judgment day. So here's the question. Do you have any crowns? Do you have any boasting? Do you have any joy before the Lord on the day that you meet him? And if not, why not? This is what God has called us to be and to do. Is there a greater reason in all the world to invest our lives in other people than that? I want to advance the kingdom of God, and I want to have something to boast in Christ for, uh, before Christ on Judgment Day. So think about that, guys. If not, why not? And fifth, lastly, I would say this. Oh, I wanted to share this with you, actually. Uh, making disciples is the fastest way to get the gospel across the globe. Number five. Making disciples is the fastest way to get the gospel across the globe. Let me share this with you. Che, I know you preach. Do you, do you preach to a thousand people a day by chance? <laughs> no. no, okay. Do you, yeah, I don't know many that do. Do you know that if you preach to 1,000 people, 1,000 different people every single day of your life, with seven, uh, 7 billion people on the planet, do you know how many years it would take to reach 7 billion people? 19,178 years. And that's without a growing population. So if you preach to 1,000 people a day, now I'm not saying we shouldn't preach because Jesus says go and preach the gospel to all creation. We should preach. But what if, what if instead I said, hey, you know what, I'm going to invest my life in three men. And they're going to promise me that they'll invest their life in three men. And we're going to do that for a year at a time. So take three men, for me, if you're a woman, take three women. And for one year, invest your life in them making a disciple. At the end of the year, you'll have three. But if they promise to do the same, and their disciples promise to do the same, let me share with you what happens. Year one, you get three disciples. I'm going to skip ahead. Year seven, do you know how many you have? 2,100. Year 10, do you know how many you have? 59,000. Year 15, 14 million. You ready for this? In year 21, 10,460,353,203 disciples. We can reach the world for Christ through discipleship. Three a year in 21 years. That's why I love the mission of your church. You ever heard that number before? Isn't that astounding? To so pour in to three people a year. All right, step three. So that was, what is it? Why is it important? Step three is, why don't we do it? Or maybe we should say, why don't you do it? I'm not saying you don't, by the way. I'm just, <laughs> that's, a, so no judgment there, <laughs> okay? Um, one, what I've found out is that most people have never been discipled. Out of 10 men I meet, probably two or three would say I've been discipled. And of those, fewer have made a disciple. You simply can't give away what you don't have. You can't give away what you don't have. So if you haven't been discipled and you don't know how to do it, please talk to Che. Talk to somebody and say, hey, I want to be discipled because I want to disciple other people. You have a whole year. You can learn everything you need to in a year. And you can teach Everything that's needed in a year. Two, the lack of tools or training and confidence. Confidence. In any endeavor, confidence comes with what? Competence. When we have been adequately trained and have the right tools, our confidence grows. Years after my mentor had poured into me, 
Although I had the passion for discipleship way deep in my heart, I still felt ill-equipped to disciple others. The doubts were real. I can't pray like my mentor. I can't lead people to Christ like my mentor. I don't have his faith. I definitely don't have his stories or experiences. Does anybody have a mentor in here? Has anybody ever felt that? I can't be like them. I loved Mike so much. I just never thought that I could do for others what he had done for me. And it kept me on the sidelines for way too long. Probably five to eight years or so, it kept me on the sidelines. Not that I wasn't doing something. But I didn't have an ability or I didn't have the confidence and the tools to go and do that. He was a pastor. He did a 40-day fast every year. I could go on for accolades about what he did. He, he was the first man that cried at the drop of a hat. And I was like, what's going on? But he teared up like Che did this morning because the Holy Spirit is just all over him. You know what I've learned? I've learned, especially for men, the closer you are to Christ, the more you tear up. That's what I've learned. It's happened in my own life. So, years later, my pastor friend Josh Rolfe shared with me this set of questions. And that's what we've developed, this know, grow, and go. I'm not here to promote my discipleship materials at all. It's not what it's about. Um, but I want discipleship to be easy to learn, hard to forget, simple to use, and most importantly, duplicatable. And so that's what I'm trying to produce, and I'm working with Che and other friends on that. Number three, fear of failure, and this is important, guys. Fear is natural in the flesh. Everybody, anybody ever felt fear? Anybody? All right, everybody gets scared, and that's okay. Did you know God addresses fear over 500 times in the Bible? Over 500 times in the Bible, God talks about fear. In fact, 103 times he says, fear not. Do not be afraid. To be fruitful for Christ, we can't let fear freeze us. Instead, we need to reframe failure and restructure our view of success. Okay, so we're going to do that right now. We're going we're to take a little time and do that. So let's reframe failure. I believe, and I talked to Rock and all my kids about this, especially in sports, but failure only exists when we stop moving forward, if we quit. The only way failure exists is if you quit. Every other failure is just a learning experience, teaching us how to improve and get better the next time. Did you know, again, I'm thinking about the Rangers too much, but <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> You know the best baseball players in the world get paid millions of dollars a year to bat 300? That means they're getting on base 30% of the time. They succeed one-third of the time, yet they keep going. They don't focus on their failure, but they focus on the foul balls that they hit because they're closer. They focus on the home runs. They focus on the base hits, and we're wise when we do the same. Has anyone ever been fishing? I know I'm a country boy. I already said that. My daughter has back there and been fishing. All right, my man in the backwards hat, you've been fishing. All right, did you catch anything? Uh, not, lately. not lately, okay. All right. <laughs> Fishermen do not count the casts. They count the fish they catch. If you're a fisherman and you counted the casts, <laughs> 1,001, 1,002, oh, there's a bite, right? That's not what happens. If you do that, you never go fishing again, right? You count the fish, and then you brag about how big the fish is a little bit. Fish stories kind of like go like this, right? <laughs> We're fishers of men. What are we counting? Are we counting the failures? Are we counting the times we get rejected? Are we counting the people that are encouraged in Christ, right? Wise men and women don't win or lose. They win or learn. Wise men and women don't win or lose. They win or learn. Michael Jordan, I never thought I'd quote him in a sermon, but here we go. <laughs> I've missed more than 9,000 shots in my career. I've lost almost 300 games. 26 times I've been trusted to take the game-winning shot and missed. I've failed over and over and over and over again in my life, and that's why I succeed. If that's worldly wisdom, how much more wisdom do we have in the scriptures for that? Thomas Edison, light bulb, right? I have not failed. I've just found 10,000 ways that don't work. Right? Share the gospel. Hey, you haven't failed 10,000 times. You just have found 10,000 times it didn't work. We'll get better. So let's restructure success. Mother Teresa said God hasn't called us to be successful, just faithful. 
God hasn't called us to be successful, just faithful. Success to God is not the same as it is to man. Success for Stephen was faithful unto death, and he was stoned. Do you remember that story? Success for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego was also faithfulness, but their story ended up in God saving them. But they were both faithful. An easily overlooked part of their story was that they were threatened by the king in Daniel 3, and by the way, it was a very bad threatening. (laughs) But they answered him this. They said, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so, our God whom we serve is able, everybody say able, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, say, but if not. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. But even if he doesn't, you see, in life and death, these men were successful because they were faithful and left the outcomes up to God. Lastly, I would say, let's overcome fear. Courage is feeling the fear and doing it anyway. Courage is feeling the fear and doing it anyway. I was scared today. Ask my wife. It's hard to get up in front of a bunch of people you don't know and do this. Do it anyway. Do it anyway. That is courage. Like when Peter walked on water, success doesn't come without the fear of sinking and sometimes without the fear of death. As the saying goes, good sailors aren't made on calm seas. But if faithfulness to God is our great goal, we cannot fail. God is able to save us, but even if he doesn't, we will not bow down to fear. As Job said, though he slay me, I will hope in him. We typically don't face death in America for our faith, although they do in many other countries around the world. But even in dying, we really live because Jesus conquered death. Revelation 14, 13 says, Blessed are those who die in the Lord from now on. Blessed indeed, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, for their deeds will follow them. You guys remember a movie called Gladiator? I know we're old enough. Anybody? Gladiator, good movie. He says, what you do in life, well, he kind of has a better accent than that. What you do in life, men, echoes in eternity. It's a biblical principle. What we do in life echoes in eternity for Christ. For Christ. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of self control. Amen? Amen. Joshua 1 9 says, Have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous? Do not be frightened and do not be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Doesn't that sound like Matthew 28? What Jesus says in Matthew 28? And wherever you go, lo, I will be with you to the end of the age. All right, this is my last page. Are you guys happy about that? (laughs) No, thank you. All right, step four, how. How to make disciples. If I could summarize discipleship down into the most simple process possible, here it is. Meet with a friend once a week for an hour and ask them one question. Ask them one question. What has the Lord been doing in your life this week? That's it. One question. Call it the one question discipleship method. Sit down with a friend every week and say, what's the Lord been doing in your life this week? And if they say, man, nothing, then be like, are you in the word of God? Are you praying? Are you serving other people? Are you sharing the gospel? Because if you're doing those things, you can't have nothing to say. So it forces you into the rhythms of grace with Christ. Are you guys with me on that? So sit down. Simple. Anybody can do this. If you can ask one question, you can help make a disciple. What's the Lord doing in your life? And get them in the word of God. Get them to pray. Get them to serve others and share the gospel. My best friend from high school, J.T. Pat, and I did this for almost 10 to 15 years, maybe, every day when we commuted to work. I was here in Dallas. He was in Missouri. He was in pharmaceutical sales. I had a bunch of different jobs, and um, we talked every day. Maybe we would miss once a week, and we would say, man, what did the Lord do yesterday? And people would be like, "What what do you have to talk about every day? I promise you, 
If you're walking with Jesus, if you're in the Word of God, if you're serving other people, if you're praying, you'll have something to talk about every day, probably every hour. Side note is, he ended up in full-time ministry. He planted a church in Missouri, and now I'm in full-time ministry. So be careful. If you pick a friend and do that, your life will change. So that's it, guys. Those are the four questions. And you can take those questions with any different piece of the Scriptures and teach it. So what is it? Why is it important? Why don't I do it? And how do I do it? You guys can go and use those questions to make disciples. Let me end with this. C.T. Studd once said, This life will soon be past. Only what we do for Christ will last. Say that again. This life will soon be past. Only what we do for Christ will last. What will you do for Christ with your life? It's likely that you have goals of some kind. We have goals for our workouts. Was the five kid guy, he's the one who's huge, right? The big guy, what's his name? The the white shirt, big guy? Jeff. Jeff. I know Jeff has goals working out, (laughs) right? Anybody? You can't tell that I do, but hey, that's fine. All right? We have goals. Anybody have goals for your career? Anybody have goals for your finances? No hands raised? (laughs) Okay, here you go. I'll I'll turn around. You guys... (laughs) You guys, like, I'm not, I'm baiting you into something, aren't I? Right? Let me ask you a question. I'm very serious. Do you have gospel goals? Do you have gospel goals? Are you asking the Lord to use you to lead people to Christ? Are you asking the Lord to use you to make disciples? So that's my challenge for you guys today it's the last thing i want you to do if you again if you journal or take it on your notes on your phone or whatever it is i want you to write down two things i want you to say lord use me to lead fill in the blank however many numbers you want 10 20 200 000. i don't care but write down goals lord use me to lead 20 people to christ in my life And then I want you to write the second question. Lord, will you use me to make, fill in the blank, number of disciples with my life? If you do three a year, you can do the math. Fill that in. Maybe it's 30, maybe it's 60, maybe it's 100. I don't know. But write down, Lord, will you use me to lead 100 people to Christ? Will you use me to disciple 100 people? And I promise you, what you focus on grows. What you focus on grows. If you wake up every day and you ask the Lord that, Lord, would you use me to lead somebody to Christ today? There was a man named Praying Hyde, and he did that. He started with one, and then he, God answered that prayer, one a day. So he asked the Lord for two. God answered that prayer. He asked for three. God answered that prayer. He asked for four. By the time he passed away, God was using him annually, average, for four people to lead to Christ every day. Maybe you're the next five or ten. Maybe you're the next Billy Graham. You never know. But are you asking? Jesus says in the New Testament, you have not. This is in James. You have not because you ask not. Right? Why don't we just ask? Our lives would change. So the, the entire discipleship process starts with no. And I'm going to end it with this. Know where you're at in your walk with Christ. That's where it starts. We said know, grow, and go, right? Know, grow, and go. I'm not going to assume that everybody in here knows Jesus. So I'm going to share the gospel with you. So if you have never put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, if you don't know that you know that you know that you're going to spend eternity in heaven, the Bible says today is the day of salvation. It starts with bad news, but the bad news makes the good news even better. The bad news is, as the Bible says, that you and I have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Every single one of us in here has sinned. We could all just raise our hands, raise them both, right? We have all fallen short of the glory of God. 
But the Bible also says that while you and I were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. And then the scriptures say, listen, if you want to enter into that relationship, if you will repent of your sins and say, yes, I'm a sinner and I need a savior, and you want to not only spend eternity in heaven with Christ, but you want to have eternal life now because the relationship becomes restored, all you have to do is repent of your sins and believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. This is the simple gospel. And so I leave you with that. Che, I don't know how we want to end it. I'll, I'll hand it over to you. But I will say this. If you don't know Jesus Christ, if you have any kind of doubts, please come and talk to Che. Come and talk to myself. And let today be the day of your salvation. Today is the day to repent and believe in Jesus Christ for your Lord and Savior. Amen? All right, my friend. It's up to you. I end there. <laughs> you want to... I would love to pray out. Yeah. Did you want to play music or do anything? It's up to you. Okay. Sure. Yeah. Come on up and play and I'll, I'll pray for us. Here. I'm sorry. I got to move my stuff. Yeah. That's fine. I'll pray for us. Thank you guys, by the way, for having me. I appreciate it being here. Why don't you guys pray with me? Lord Jesus. We've just talked about the word of God. We have just shared the gospel of Jesus Christ. The good news of salvation. Lord, I'm remembering what Chase started off with for healing. Lord, maybe there are people here today that have something in their heart, something in their relationship, something in their mind that they need healing from, your healing touch. God, I pray that they will have the courage to share it with a brother or sister in Christ today. I pray that they will lean on you. And I pray that you will heal them. Lord, there are some here today that may not know you as Lord and Savior. Lord, whether they come up front now or raise a hand or talk to Che later or whatever it is, Lord... I pray that today is the day of salvation. That they will walk out of this church knowing that they will spend eternity with you in heaven. And, and that's the beginning. That they will be about sharing the gospel to the ends of the earth. That they will be about making disciples. Lord, I pray for this church I thank you that they are disciples. I love their mission. Be a disciple and make disciples. I pray that today they have been a little bit more encouraged to grow in their faith, to make more and more disciples. I pray that you fill this room. I pray that they get so many people coming into this room that they have to change places. And lastly, pray, Lord, I pray that they write those goals down, that they sincerely ask you, Lord, use me to lead the nations to Christ. Lord, use me to make disciples. Lord, we love you. Lord, we ask you to do in our lives what only you can do. If anybody needs prayer, if anybody wants to talk, I'm come and talk to Che or myself but we're going to worship for just maybe a song or two thank you Jesus we love you Jesus in your name amen what gift of grace is Jesus my Redeemer there is no more for heaven now to give he is my joy my righteousness
righteousness and freedom my steadfast love my deep and boundless peace to this i owe my hope is only jesus for my life is only bound to his oh how strange and divine i can sing all is mine yet not i but through christ in me the night is dark but I am not forsaken for by my side my Savior he will stay I labor and rejoicing for in my need his power is displayed to this I all my shepherd will defend me through the deepest valley he will lead all the night has been won and I shall No fate I dread, I know I am forgiven. The future sure, the price it has been paid. For Jesus fled and suffered for my pardon. And he was raised to overthrow the grave. every breath I long to follow Jesus for he has said that he will bring me home and day by day I know he will renew me until I stand with joy before the throne to the
Man, thank you, Trog, for the word this morning and really encouraging us as a church uh, how we can really pursue uh, relationships here in our church and to intentionally pursue our, the relationships in our church. And that just lines up to our prayer this morning of just really asking God to heal relationships, heal our, our pains and, and, and all the things that we've going through, we are going through in, in our life. And just really, really thankful for that encouraging word. I feel like all of us really, if you are doing discipleship, I know you have been doing it for a while for many of you. Hopefully that gave you like a boost of like, man, this, there is a, there is a, a reason and a purpose of why we are pouring into people's lives intentionally. Uh, and for us to continue that, if you haven't or if you're not, uh, please, seriously, please start thinking about who would you love to pour into or who would you love to uh, be receiving discipleship from as well. Uh, and again, last thing that Trog mentioned, uh, being clear of your salvation. Guys, if you don't know who Christ is, we do want you to know who Christ is. And you can talk to any of us here, like any of your people that you know you see up here, like anyone up here even, you can talk to us and have conversation. You can talk to the people even next to you, and I'm sure they can help you with understanding what it is it mean to accept Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. Because um, we do want us, we do as a church want you to know Christ first and foremost before anything else, uh, before you start. Let me pray for us out, and then, um, yeah, we'll just enjoy our time of fellowship afterwards. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much, God, for this morning. God, we thank you that you are such a good, good Father, just like we worshiped you this morning. And God, how you are a God that gives us good gifts. And all of these good gifts that we have received, they all come from you. And so this morning, we just want to thank you. We want to thank you for your many gifts. And specifically this morning, I just want to thank you for the gift of relationships that you have placed in all of our lives this morning. And God, God we are thankful because you knew when we needed that connection in this world, in this, in this broken and fallen world that we live in. And God, that we believe, God, that you are the God that is a good, good father. And because you're so good, your timing is good. Your gifts are good. Everything that you give to us is good. And so, God, we're so thankful for that. And help us to appreciate this morning the little things as well as the big things that you have given to us. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God our Father, and the power, communion, and fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen. Stain until he come.
that cross couldn't break you. Yeah, the darkness couldn't take you. Faithful, faithfully, even when my days are pain. 